A carnival atmosphere in Jamaica, but this isn't Carnival Week. These government supporters are celebrating victory in the island's recent general elections. For them, this was just a sigh of relief after a very tense and hard-fought campaign. Elections in the Caribbean don't normally arouse world attention, but this one was different. By common consent, it was Jamaica's most important vote since independence 14 years ago. Victory went to the island's current premier, Michael Manley. He won by a landslide, and for him, it means five more years in power at the head of the PNP, the People's National Party, founded by his father. His opponents accuse him of bringing Jamaica to the verge of ruin, but to his supporters, he's a hero. Manley's victory imposed a crushing defeat on the opposition, the Jamaican Labour Party, or JLP. That defeat was largely unexpected, for the JLP had campaigned as a party with every expectation of winning power. Leading the fight for the JLP was Edward Siaga, a finance minister in the JLP administrations that ran Jamaica in the first decade after independence. Siaga claimed that when he left office four years ago, Jamaica had been prosperous, but now it was in debt, and he had no doubt about where to lay the blame. This PNP government has no plan. Now you and I know that in everything that you do in life, whether you're going to put up a building or you're going to go to your field to plant, you have to have a plan. Come out and march your... Despite its name, the JLP represents the island's traditional owners of wealth. Most Jamaicans saw the election as a choice between conservative and socialist. For Mr. Siaga, the contrast was more extreme. The accusation of communism was central to the JLP's campaign. Mr. Manley rejected it outright. The, the whole thing, the whole communist charge is really a trumped up thing that is used to try to justify and excuse violence and an attempt to sort of upset and confuse people. It's, it's worse than just dishonest, it is really quite vicious. Mr. Farmer, remember what farmers' prices were. The key to the government's victory was Mr. Manley's capturing of the rural vote, which had traditionally gone to the JLP. Many observers saw this as simply confirming his party's claim to be the natural mouthpiece for Jamaica's working masses. Manley describes himself as a democratic socialist who sees capitalism as an evil, though a necessary one. In many countries, he'd be regarded as a moderate, and it's only fairly recently that he's been branded an extremist. One way in which he's attracted the charge is by fostering friendly relations with Cuba. This school, donated by the Castro regime, was opened by Mr. Manley at the height of the campaign. To his opponents, his approval of the project was all the proof they needed that he was planning to lead Jamaica down the Cuban path to revolution. Mr. Manley has been adamant in his support for the school. He's described it as being conceived in friendship and carried out with love. Love is a word he uses often. He's a devout Christian who believes that his form of socialism is Christianity in action. As far as he's concerned, the Cuban school is simply cooperation for its own sake. And he's said that anyone who believes there are always strings to this kind of aid is still caught up in the tired attitudes of the past. There is emerging in the third world a new kind of international relationship. Because we have all shared the experience of domination, all third world countries begin 
with a first commitment to the preservation of their own national sovereignty and to the development of a principle of non-interference in their internal affairs. Opinions like that were sweet words indeed for the Cuban ambassador, seen here with Jamaican Foreign Minister Dudley Thompson. How did he rate the school as a link between the two countries? Well, I think it's very important because uh, the way the has been carried out by the workers, we saw a tremendous effort that uh, really can be done only uh, due to the friendly relationship that exists between our two countries. A lot, of people, a lot of people have wondered, Mr. Ambassador, whether your being involved in something like a school is only a prelude to being involved internally in Jamaica in a more, in a more political way. Is that, is that right? I completely wrong. It's an honest, it's an honest, honest gift, an honest and sincere gift as between one friendly socialist country and another friendly socialist country. It was an unsolicited gift. And I'll tell you some more. This gift was done by joint Cuban-Jamaican labor three months before time, before schedule, by voluntary labor. And all those machinery you saw over there just now is being left as a gift. The laborers have gone, having left the plan and the training and this school as an answer to any propaganda. One of the most important aspects of the election has been the violence that's marked the campaign. Troops have been out in force for months. They've had to be. Jamaica's been in a state of emergency since June, and whilst politicians have argued, gunmen have been shooting it out in the streets. In the six months before the emergency, 163 people died in shooting incidents. There have been fewer deaths since, but 11 people were killed in the last two weeks alone. The government put appeals on television and radio. Violence is destructive and degrading. Please help in every possible way to make this general election campaign a peaceful one. We, the people of Jamaica, deserve no less. Argument has raged about just who was responsible, but the most damaging allegation was that America's CIA has been deliberately trying to destabilize Jamaica to engineer Manley's downfall. Dr. Kissinger and former CIA director William Colby have both denied the charge. Whatever the cause is, the government acted strongly to curb the violence. Since the emergency began in June, over 400 people have been held without trial and special gun courts have dealt with unlicensed arms. The opposition called it dictatorial, but the government claimed it was the only way to ensure a reasonably free election. Behind the violence and the purely political arguments, Jamaica's economy is in serious trouble. Jamaicans once wrote poems in praise of the waving sugar cane, but today the sugar industry inspires nothing but despondency. This cane, on one of the island's biggest plantations, will fetch only a fifth of the price it would have done two years ago. Workers' cooperatives were set up in this part of the island to give cane farmers a greater share of the profits. Minimum wages were also increased sharply. But profits have almost disappeared in fluctuations of the world market system over which Jamaica has little or no control. Cuba has offered to share its expertise in sugar technology, which should help to improve efficiency. Apart from that, the government can only sit back and hope that further changes in world conditions will once again make sugar a significant contributor to the economy. This is Jamaica's biggest earner of foreign exchange, bauxite. It's gouged out of huge pits like this, dried, and then processed into alumina before being shipped to North America for the manufacture of aluminium. It's all done by North American companies, including such giants as America's Alcoa. Estimates of the value of their investment range as high as $1,000 million. The Manly government has imposed heavy taxes on the companies and has moved steadily towards state control of the industry under howls of protest from the opposition. In practice, government control is still comparatively small, though it has bought all mining land and plans to lease it back to farmers once mining operations are over. 
Unfortunately, government participation in the industry has taken place during a bout of world inflation and recession, and that's meant a fall in demand. Some processing plants have been running at less than half their capacity, and revenues paid to the government have suffered accordingly. Future prospects, though, are fairly good, and the industry is expected to pick up quite sharply in 1977. For the ordinary Jamaican, the economic problems have made themselves felt as unemployment and inflation. About a quarter of the workforce is now without a job, and inflation is around 30%. Both developments have hit hardest at the very people the manly government is most trying to help. A lot's already been done, with the establishment of minimum wage rates and a variety of social reform measures. But a lot more remains to be done. And in speeches since his victory, Mr. Manley has made it clear that he'll use every means at his disposal to give a better deal to Jamaica's poor, such as those who live here, in the barren shantytown known as Sufferers Heights. For Mr. Manley, scenes like this are living proof of how Jamaica's people have been betrayed over the centuries by the twin evils of colonialism and capitalism. And if helping to redress the balance means turning Jamaica to the left and accepting help from neighbors such as Cuba, then he's quite prepared to do so. Whilst the poor have been receiving the government's attentions, Jamaica's wealthier citizens have been reassessing their position. Thousands of them, especially the well-qualified middle classes, have already left, taking their capital and their expertise with them. Meanwhile, the tourists who normally flock to Jamaica's luxury hotels have been staying away. At the Playboy Hotel on the island's famous north coast, it's been the worst season for years. The Calypso Quartet still performs its lunchtime stint, but news of the murders and shootings has gone abroad, and the rich American tourists just haven't bothered to come. Even the Playboy's traditional attractions have failed to draw in the customers. For the island as a whole, tourist receipts are down by 20%, a loss of $25 million to the economy. Bringing those tourists and dollars back is only one of many problems Mr. Manley will face in his next five years in power. <laughs> 